You're listening to a podcast by Lance Lambert Ministries. For more information on this ministry, visit lancelambert.org and follow us on Telegram to receive all of our updates. What is intercession? We can likely see the importance of praying and interceding for our own nation, but is there a need to intercede for Israel? In this episode, Lance speaks about God's desire that the heart of the Christian be aligned with his own heart for Israel. Let's listen. Now in this uh, first session this morning, I'd like you to turn uh, to uh, a number of scriptures. I'd like you to turn first of all to Revelation and chapter 8. Revelation and chapter 8 and from verse 3. Revelation chapter 8 from verse 3. And another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should add it unto the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel taketh the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it upon the earth. And there followed thunders and voices and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels that had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now I would just like to make a comment on that before we uh, begin this morning, just in case you're a little mystified. Uh, Whatever your view of uh, the book of Revelation is, you have here a very interesting turning point in the whole record of the visions. After this, with the seven trumpets, begins the last great phase in this book of Revelation. And however we view it, the fact remains that this little picture that was given to John stands at this turning point. We suddenly see the saints praying. And the saints are very, very conscious of their weakness, of their inability. And we see an angel adding incense, which is always a symbol of the attributes, the characteristics, of the Lord Jesus and the work of the Lord Jesus and he adds into their prayers all the glorious holiness and purity and power uh, of the work and person of the Lord Jesus and as those prayers go up mingled with the incense something happens there are there as it says here Fire is cast upon the earth. Fire from the altar. And then thunders and voices and lightnings and an earthquake. And then the seven angels get on with the job. And I find that very interesting. It's a different kind of picture of prayer to what is normally understood in Christian circles. Very often in Christian circles, prayer is looked upon as trying somehow or other to uh, wring out of an unwilling God certain things. He doesn't really want to do anything. He is a kind of um, distant, impersonal being who has no great interest in things on this earth. But when one or two people get together in the name of Jesus, they can twist his arm, as it were, and make him do what he doesn't really want to do. This is a fallacy. 
That's why people try to corner God. They try to manipulate God. They try to wring out of God uh, things uh, that they feel should be done that apparently he doesn't want to do. He doesn't want to save people. He doesn't want to bless um, his redeemed people. He doesn't want to build up the body of Christ. He doesn't want to take away the veil on the Jewish heart. He doesn't want to restore the natural branches into uh, their own olive tree. But if one or two believers, miracle of miracles, get together and are agreed, then God will just have to do what he doesn't really want to do. Now this picture in the book of Revelation is something quite different. It reveals to us that effective intercession is a mystery. God actually, if God is God, he doesn't need you and me. If God needs you and me, he is not God. Because he is insufficient. But God is sufficient. He doesn't really need you and me. He is perfectly capable of doing everything he wants to do without us. But the mystery of intercession is that he has willed that he will not fulfill his purpose without us. And he wants to call uh, uh, men and women born of the Spirit of God, saved through the grace, his grace, Join to him in one spirit. He wants to involve us in the fulfillment of his purposes. In other words, this kind of prayer begins with God. By the Spirit of God comes into the saints, comes out of their mouths in a burden, in an anguish as it were. Into it is added all the attributes of the person and work of the Lord Jesus and the end is the purpose of God is fulfilled. All the wheels of heaven begin to whir into motion and uh, the purpose of God goes on to its fulfillment. Now we have another little picture of this in the book of Acts and chapter 4. I'm sure most of you know this as well. Acts chapter 4 from verse 23. And being let go, they came to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And they, when they heard it, lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, O Lord, thou that didst make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit by the mouth of our father David, thy servants did say, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves in array, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For of a truth, in this city against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel were gathered together to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel foreordained to come to pass. And now, Lord, look upon their threatenings and grant unto thy servants to speak thy word with all boldness, while thou stretchest forth thy hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken wherein they were gathered together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them said that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles their witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Now again, may I just make a comment on this. You notice the kind of prayer this is? The church in its very early days was facing one of its first crises. Two of their leaders had been imprisoned, had been scourged, had been threatened, and in the most wonderful way, in answer to prayer, 
had come out. But now the church got to prayer before the Lord. They didn't ask that they might be preserved merely from injury and harm. Will you notice how they begin first by recognizing that there is nothing in the whole universe that has not been created by God? including the chief priests and the elders. So there is nothing outside of the scope of God's authority and power. That's the first thing. Then the second thing, the Holy Spirit gave them understanding of the situation by illuminating a portion of the Word of God. They didn't pray see a whole great book or passage, they took the relevant statement of God's Word and they made it their foundation as they sought the Lord. Will you notice too that they recognized that the purpose of God was in it all? The, uh, it says Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel all were gathered together to do what God had foreordained should be done. So they recognize nothing but the purpose of God. Then they ask the Lord, now, see their threatenings and grant boldness to the church that she might be able, uh, um, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of thy holy servant, Jesus. Now, everyone gets so excited, as I said to the prayer seminar the other day, about the place being shaken. I don't know what's wrong with Christians. I mean, why should people get excited about a place being shaken? That's chicken feed as far as God is concerned. Shaking a place is no big thing. It's just the same with these um, thunders and the lightnings and voices and so on. That's not really, that's the symptoms, if you like. The real thing was that the seven angels prepared to sound the trumpets. That was the thing that the prayer had touched. The rest were the symptoms. And so it is here, the place being shaken was only an outward symptom. The miracle was that the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and soul. That was the miracle. And, of course, they preached the Word of God with boldness, with signs and wonders. Well, now, I want to just uh, mention those things. I also now want to turn you to the book of Daniel and chapter 9. The book of Daniel and chapter 9. From verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet for the accomplishing of the desolations of Jerusalem, even seventy years. Here we have the same thing again. This isn't just Daniel trying to get God to do something that he thinks ought to be done. But here we discover that the Holy Spirit has revealed to Daniel something of the overall purpose of God, and more than that, its application in his own day and generation. And the Holy Spirit has done it through illuminating the words of God, the Word of God. It was the book of Jeremiah that he understood it by. Now Daniel begins prayer. You would think that if the Lord had already said a generation earlier that something was going to happen, that there was no need to pray. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen whether we pray or we don't. But Daniel understood something differently. Verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God who keepeth covenant and loving kindness with them that love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned 
and have dealt perversely and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even turning aside from thy precepts and from thine ordinances. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets that spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of face as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings, to our princes and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even turning aside that they should not obey thy voice. Therefore hath the curse been poured out upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet have we not entreated the favor of the Lord our God that we should turn from our iniquities and have discernment in thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched over the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renown as at this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, let thine anger and thy wrath, I pray thee, be turned away from the city, thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people have become a reproach to all that are round about us. Now therefore, O our God, hearken unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercy's sake. Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not. For thine own sake, O oh my God, because thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gab Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he instructed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee wisdom and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment went forth, and I am come to tell thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Now I have read the whole of that great sample prayer of Daniel's intercession. He was an intercessor above and beyond every other gift that God had given him. Daniel is involved in the fulfillment of God's purpose. He is not trying to get the Lord to do something he does not want to do. He is seeking, as it were, to bring into fulfillment what God has already said that he wants to do. Now, you may not see this as so important immediately, 
But when we come to talk about the matter of intercession and Israel, we are dealing, I believe, with something which lies in the very heart of God. Something which God has already revealed. That it is His purpose to do this thing. I believe when we turn to the New Testament and to Romans and chapter 11 and verse 28 we have these words as touching the gospel they are enemies for your sake but as touching the election they are beloved for the father's sake for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now there are people who tell me that the, the whole theology concerning the restoration of the Jewish people to their land and to their nationhood is based upon the Old Testament. And that as a result we have to be very careful because the foundation, they say, is weak. Uh, we can uh, do really nothing about that. If that's their view of the Scripture, we have to leave it with them. But in actual fact, they go on to say the New Testament has nothing to say about this restoration of the Jewish people. And we have to say that the New Testament has quite a lot to say about the restoration of the Jewish people. And uh, because it, this is not principally the subject this morning, I'm only touching on it. But here in this verse, I believe we have a foundational, inspired, authoritative statement of God's Word which cannot be contradicted or explained away. It says, as touching the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. It is perfectly clear that it is the Jewish people who are in view. Nobody has been able to spiritualize that and say that it's the church as touching the gospel. The church are enemies for your sake. It is perfectly clear that the enemies um, are the Jewish people and that God has made them enemies for the sake of the Gentiles that he might bring the, the Gentiles into the salvation of God. Now, Wade goes on to say, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gift, and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, I know it's not such a popular word in these days, but election is all to do with the predestinating counsel and will of God. Whether we believe that that predestination of God is based on his foreknowledge or not, does not come into the question this morning. The fact is election has something to do with the predestination of God, his predestinating counsel and will. And we have this word used here concerning the Jewish people. Everywhere else it is used in connection with the church. They are the elect people of God. But here it is used in connection with the Jewish people as touching the predestinating counsel and will of God. 
They are loved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Dear friends, we have very much else, of course, here in this uh, uh, chapter. Uh, we read words like this in verse 12. Now, if therefore is the riches of the world, and their loss the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? The statement inspired by the Spirit of God is not emphasizing the fall and the loss of the Jewish people, but the fullness of the Jewish people. The whole argument is if riches have come to the world and to the Gentiles through the fall of the Jewish people and the loss of the Jewish people, how much greater fullness of riches will come to the world and the Gentiles through their restoration. So, my dear friends, it's not again as if the apostle has only one off statement. He goes on to make it abundantly plain in verse 15. <clears throat> now, if the casting away of them is the reconciling of the world, what will the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Dear friends, I believe in this matter <coughs> of intercession that we are dealing with something... Uh, let me put it again. Dear friends, I believe that in dealing with this matter of intercession and Israel, we are dealing with something to do with the predestinating counsel and will of God. We are not trying to get the law to do something he basically does not want to do, but something which he has revealed as very much to do with his purpose and program. Now, <clears throat> I believe that the deepest and most effective prayer is working with God. If I was asked, what is intercession? In its deepest, most powerful, and most significant form, I would say it is working together with God. Can you think of anything that is a greater privilege for the child of God than to be introduced into such a fellowship with God in the fulfillment of His purposes? Especially when we know that the Lord could do it without us. But in some marvelous way, He has said, I will not do it without mine own. Of course, not all of His own will enter in to such a fellowship with him. But God is calling in these days as many as will to commit themselves to the Lord that they might be trained and qualified by the Holy Ghost to become workers together with God in the fulfillment of his purposes. Israel stands in colossal need of this kind of prayer. She cannot herself pray at present in this way. 
and there is therefore only one body of people in the whole universe who are able to fulfill this kind of ministry. And it is the redeemed people of God. You and I, we occupy a unique position in the counsels of God. For we have been delivered from the powers of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of God's own and dear Son. We have been joined to Him, and by the Spirit of God, we can be trained to become with Him intercessors in the achieving or securing the realization of the purpose of God. I want to say it again. Israel in the first place does not need more money. She is in need of much money at present. But that is not her foremost need. Nor is her foremost need more arms, more effective or powerful arms. Nor is it the kindness and support of superpowers. Or friends, what Israel needs are the hosts of heaven. Israel needs the armies of God in the heavenlies to work for her, behind her, overruling, controlling. That's what Israel needs. And there's only one people in the whole world who can enter this spiritual battle with the powers of darkness and see that the armies of heaven, as it were, are mobilized uh, to see the fulfillment of the purpose of God. Now having said this, I want to tell you something. I am perfectly aware, wherever I go, that there are an awful lot of cranks and nutcases that get drawn like a magnet to this Israel question. We spend, we have to spend, in my estimation, an inordinate amount of time praying out the nutcases that come to Jerusalem. They, I, I, I want to make a distinction between what I call eccentrics and nutcases. There are eccentrics. I don't want to offend any of the relatives, but Ord Wingate was an eccentric. He was not a nutcase. And there have been a whole number of others. William Heckler was an eccentric, but he was not a nutcase. There have been a number of others known to me today on the contemporary scene that I would describe as eccentrics. But they are not nutcases. But I have seen the most incredible number of nutcases. They shave their head, they throw ashes on their head, they walk round with great crosses. I'm not speaking, of course, of Arthur Blessed. But they all copy him. God has given him something to do. My dear friends, we need the kind of intercessors who have vision, real vision. I am told by so many wherever I go, oh, we've got some of the Israel cranks in our thing. They never come to the prayer meeting. They never help in the, in the thing. All they can talk about is Israel morning, noon, and night. That's not what I believe God is calling us into. I believe that a person who becomes a real intercessor for Israel will be an intercessor for the church. 
I believe a person who is a real intercessor for the Jewish people will be an intercessor for the salvation of the nations. I believe a person who is really involved in the fulfillment of God's purpose concerning, the, concerning Israel and concerning the Jewish people will be an effective functioning member of the body of our Lord Jesus in the fellowship where they are found. And until people are that kind of functioning member, we're in for trouble. Now I realize there are also problems. There are times when some people, just because they see something about Israel, are shut out altogether. People won't have anything to do with them. They're blackballed, blacklisted. I understand that. That's a problem. And God will wonderfully give grace and help to those who are in such a position. What I'm trying to say is very simple. We are not being called into some kind of romantic historical glamour complex where we're going to be involved in some egocentric way in the fulfillment of God's purposes. I believe that once the Spirit of God gives vision and then brings love into the heart and a burden that can only be described as travail, we shall be prepared to be blotted out that the purpose of God might be fulfilled. This is exactly the spirit of the Apostle Paul in Romans and chapter uh, 9. I say the truth in the Messiah. I lie not my conscience bearing witness with me in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing pain in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were anathema from Christ, anathema, cursed from the Messiah, for my brethren's sake my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelis. Or again in chapter 10 and verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and my supplication to God is for them that they may be saved. Do you not agree with me that if the Spirit of God could conceive this kind of burden in our hearts, there would be no time for the lunatic fringe. We would not have time for weird things. Something would have been conceived in us which will only be born through the pain of travail. And that pain will so consume us that we shall have to learn in a new way what worship is and what praise is and what thanksgiving is in order to survive and overcome. That is the kind of intercessor that God is looking for. Believers cannot pray unless they have some kind of understanding. We very often talk about the veil on the Jewish heart, but there is a veil on the church's heart. Until the veil on the church's heart is removed, we cannot really begin to talk about the veil on the Jewish heart being removed. My dear friends, 
I believe God has a tremendous purpose for this nation and for this people. Because though there are those who believe that God's whole purpose is for the church and that God has now moved on from the Jewish people and has no further purpose for them, I believe God began, the church began with the Jews and in my estimation it will end with the Jews. That's where this whole work began here in this city and in my estimation it will end in this city. If that is the case, if it is the purpose of God to save Israel and to graft them in again, we have our work cut out. I am often asked why people pray for the economy of Israel. Why do you, I said, why are you uh, asking people to pray for the economy of Israel? I mean, what's that got to do with the purpose of God? And then you're, you're, you're praying for their military security. What's that got to do with the purpose of God? They're not always right, you know. They do things that are wrong. This charge is made again and again and again. But my dear friends, if the purpose of God is to graft back the natural branches into their own olive tree in the final and ultimate stage, then the enemy who, thank God, has not got all sufficient knowledge but who reads the Bible as well as you and I, and who has a greater intelligence than all of us put together, and who over the thousands of years has picked up quite a lot about the purpose of God, it would seem to me that the enemy will do everything within his power to ensure that there is no Jewish people to be saved. He will economically strangle them so that the purpose of God and the, and the promises of God cannot be fulfilled. In other words, Aliyah will no longer be a coming up to Jerusalem, but a going out of Jerusalem. His purpose is to so strangle Israel economically that there will not be the jobs for the Jews from the Soviet Union or for anywhere else. There will not be the structure economically to support a population. That's why sometimes we have to pray for the economic side. Uh, the enemy will see to it that militarily Israel is eradicated or liquidated or so weakened that in the end she can be divided and destroyed. It is the purpose of the powers of darkness to somehow deal a military blow against Israel. Five times the enemy has sought to do it in a major way. And we are now heading for an even more serious blow that he is planning. My dear friends, if we do not pray for the military security of Israel, there will be no Jewish people to be saved. Or again, take the moral question. It is not often talked about because as believers we don't want to, after the years of bitter prejudice and accusation against Jewish people, involve ourselves in anything that would seem to give support 
to that kind of critical attitude. But I believe the powers of darkness will work as they're working in all the nations of the earth to undermine Israel morally. To bring immorality to such a level that it will demand the judgment of God. To bring all those kinds of gangland mafia type intrigues to such a place that it will demand the judgment of God. That's why we need to pray for Israel. To pray that God will raise up voices in Israel against these very things. Yes, my dear friends, I hope that you can see at least what I am seeking to communicate to you. Intercession in Israel. Our real object in praying for Israel in the end is to see them in the place where God wants them. Restored. Not only recreated, but restored. Life from the dead. That's what we want to see. But if we want to see that, then we're going to have to pray for economic things. We're going to have to pray for political things. We're going to have to pray for military things. We're going to have to pray for moral things. All these things will uh, need our prayer. You know, and may I just say this in an aside. One of the things I find most remarkable, wherever I go, for years and years I saw what the church was. And I went everywhere ministering in days when somehow or other the very word church was not understood. Everyone understood in those days the church is a place where you left your umbrella or your handbag. It was a structure. It was a place, it was an organization, it was an institution, it was anything but the body of Christ. If you said the church is the body of Christ, people with mouths and <laughs> What does he mean? What's he talking about? Or you get the idea of, oh, mystical. Mystical. Dear friends, I, I believe that God is calling us now in these days to see something concerning Israel. Because we have reached the point in time where God is going to work in a new way. Now, I, the thing I find so amazing is wherever I go, people will say to me, oh, and, the, and no doubt you've all heard it. I've probably heard it more than you. People say to me, it's the enemy's business you're doing. It's a diversion. To use English English, a cul-de-sac. For you Americans, with what you call American English, a dead end. It's a dead end. We're afraid of this matter of Israel. It takes people away from the building of the church. It takes them away from being functioning members of the body of Christ. We are afraid. We don't want anything to do with it. One brother told me the whole thing was based on a fallacy. And therefore, because it's based on a fallacy, it is demonic. And this is the most insidious threat, according to him, that the purpose of God to restore the church in our day has faced. I have only one simple answer. Wherever I go, because I have been involved with the intercessor movements in the world, and I'm one of the four brethren that 
watch over the many of these uh, movements. Wherever I go, I meet people who intercede for their land, for their nation, and above all, for the purpose and work of God in their own land and nation. And this is what I have found. I have found not once, not a thousand times, but many, many more times, that the people who have the deepest burden for their own land and their own nation and for the purpose of God, for His people in that land and nation have a burning travail for Israel. I have sometimes in places like Norway and Finland and New Zealand and elsewhere, I have found people who come to me who've never been to Israel and do not know the first thing about Jewish matters. But they will say something like this, God woke me up the other week in the middle of the night. And I got up because I knew it was something from God. And in the end when I knelt, I found such a burden in my heart the tears ran down my face and I found I was praying for the Jewish people. Now what is this? A person who's never met the Jewish people, who has never met a Jew, who does not know anything about Jewish things, is woken up in the middle of the night and has a burden so great that they will weep for two hours? These are not cranks. These are not nutcases. These are people who have been in the front line of pioneering intercessory work for their own nation and land. Dennis Clark, who is now with the Lord, used to say that when they carried out the survey amongst intercessors all over the world, what was the second most prayed nation in the world next to your own, it was invariably Israel. Now is that not interesting? I say to my friends who tell me this is a demonic business, I say isn't this interesting that these people who are intercessors, who in my estimation are nearest to the heart of God, have a burden like this? It can hardly be called a glamour complex since they, most of them haven't got the wherewithal to come on one trip to Jerusalem. No, my friends, the nearer we get to the heart of God, the nearer we find His passion and love for Israel. Now, my friends, I think I think we will draw to an end. That's a good Pauline statement. Um, <laughs> we will begin to draw to an end. I don't know if I could help you in any way in your prayer. I want just to say one thing it may help some of you. When the Lord Jesus was born, he was born King of the Jews. I don't know what has happened in our 20th century Christian society and circles, 
Wherever I go, I hear Jesus, our Lord Jesus, described as a poor, working-class peasant, an artisan. I hear it everywhere. He evidently didn't have two coins to rub together. He came from common, poor stock. Now, it is absolutely true that the Lord Jesus was born into, as far as I know, impoverished circumstances. But there was not a single drop of peasant blood in his body. If we talk about genetics, there wasn't a single drop in his body. It was all royal. He was born king of the Jews. And when he began his public ministry as the messianic king, everywhere he went, people called to him, Son of David, which was a messianic title. He never rebuked them. You will remember that when he rode into Jerusalem, they cried out, Hosanna to the King of Israel. And when he died, by the inspiration of God and no one else, Pilate wrote a title, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, it could have been that God could have inspired Pilate to write, Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior of the world, or Jesus of Nazareth, the Prince of Peace, or a number of the other titles that he had used. But he wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Jesus was born King of the Jews. He lived as King of the Jews and he died as King of the Jews. And when God raised him up on the third day, it was to vindicate his kingship and messiahship. For we are told by uh, Peter, through inspiration again of the Holy Spirit, this same Jesus did God raise up that he might vindicate, I'm putting it in my own words, but I'll find it for you, that God hath made him know, let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom ye crucified. In other words, when God raised Jesus from the dead, he raised him as the messianic king, the Messiah king of Israel. He put him beyond the power and reach of evil men or the powers of darkness ever to dethrone. He seated him at his right hand in heavenly places until the time comes that he will return. Now, my dear friends, I read nowhere that Jesus has abdicated. I do not find anywhere that Jesus has now dropped the title King of Israel or King of the Jews and has now become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is still King of the Jews and is also King of kings and Lord of lords, ruler of the kings of the earth, this Jesus. Dear friends, what's this got to do with intercession? Well, for me, I don't know about you, for me it has a lot. I feel that if this nation has a king, and not just a figurehead, but a real king, he has a policy. He has a purpose. 
He has a will. And I believe we're called to see that that purpose concerning the Jewish people and concerning Israel as king shall be fulfilled. Just because we cannot see him doesn't mean a thing. He's actually more real than our own prime minister. And certainly has more power. My dear friends, what a marvelous thing it is when the eyes of our hearts are opened to see the spiritual world we live in. Then it is no longer a matter of flesh and blood, but it is a matter of realities. What is the reality about Israel in her economic crisis at present? What is the reality about Israel in her political crisis at present? What is the reality about Israel in her military crisis, her moral crisis? The reality is that Israel has a king. And you and I, as those who've been saved through the finished work of that Messiah King, Jesus, we are called into fellowship with him to see that the, his purpose for this people is fulfilled. Dear friends, I believe it's a marvelous thing for the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and make it real in prayer. This is, a, I understand this. I understand Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 and 18 in this light. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God, praying at all seasons in the Spirit. Now, it is true that this book is the sword of the Spirit. But I can't help feeling that the implication and inference is even more practical than just a statement that the whole Bible is the sword of the Spirit. I'm sure most of you have known what it is to try and take a scripture that God hasn't given you and to try and somehow push it into fulfillment. <laughs> it is not a sword at all. It is as dead as dead can be. And that's what happens in many of our prayer meetings. When people use scriptures that haven't been given to them by the Holy Spirit, It brings death into the whole time. But I cannot help feeling that the Holy Spirit, in any given situation, makes alive some statement, some promise, some portion of His Word, and that becomes the sword of the Spirit in that particular situation, which the church can wield. Well, I have some scriptures that at times the Holy Spirit has given me. This one about election is one. Every time I hear about Israel in problems, I use this when the Holy Spirit gives it to me. Lord, as touching the election, they are loved. Not they were loved. They are loved. Now, my friends... There are one or two other scriptures. I don't know if you've got a pencil, some of you, and would like to note these down. I'll just give them to you. Take the land. Take the land. Amos chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. I can't help wondering that would be good if you meditated on that for a while. You know, it says about planting gardens and eating the fruit and orchards and uh, fields, vineyards, drinking the wine. And they shall no more be plucked up out of the land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. 
Isn't that something to stand every time we have a military threat? Or every time we have a threat somehow or other that might just be a compromise solution that might give away part of the land that ought not to be given away? There's something I think. There must be many other scriptures you've got, but I'm just giving you one or two, just that you might know. Then what about the nation? I think of Jeremiah 31, from the verse 35 to 37. It says, whilst there is a sun and a moon, God will not cast off the nation of Israel. So my dear friends, get that one. There's one you can plead as an intercessor. Every time we have threats that we're going to be liquidated, or we're going to be massacred, or the nation's going to be destroyed, or it's going to become a secular democratic state, the Palestinian state, there you have a scripture. What about economics? Well, I have a wonderful one here. Ezekiel 36, verse 8 to 11. There it speaks about men multiplying all over the land, not your deem. But Olim, you understand? Not, Im not immigrants, immigrants. It speaks there of so much happening in the land, of it becoming fruitful and green and economy. I think of another one about the wealth of the nations being turned to Israel. We need to stand on some of these. Or the abundance of the sea. And what about Jerusalem, since this particular celebration has as one of its themes the whole matter of Jerusalem? Well, I think of a number of things, but I think particularly of Luke 21 and verse 24, the words of Jesus, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. I think uh, we have something to stand on there concerning the status of Jerusalem. Then what about wars? You want a few scriptures for wars? I think of Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 9. And I compare it with chapter 14 and verse 2. You know what I find a comfort? The Lord says, and I will gather all the nations together against Jerusalem. Now, if I feel that somehow the enemy is gathering all the nations together against Jerusalem, I have some kind of funny feeling in my stomach. But when I know that the Lord says, I will gather all the nations uh, uh, together against Jerusalem, it's a great comfort to me. I know God is in this thing. I find the same thing in Ezekiel 38, verse 34, and chapter 39 and verse 2. It's God who says, And I will put a hook through your jaw, O Gog and Magog, and I will bring you down to the mountains of Israel. You never put a hook through the jaw of a valuable domestic animal. Any of you who have a rural or agricultural background, a farming background, know very well that if you want to get a domestic ox or bull or cow or whatever else out of one field into another, you don't put a, a hook through its jaw and drag it through. You may whack it if it won't yield to kinder ways of getting it out of one field into another, but you'd never damage it for fear of infection. The, the creature's too valuable. Only when an animal is for slaughter do you put a hook through its jaw. And God says about that great military confederacy inspired from the uttermost parts of the north, I will put a hook through your jaw and draw you down to the mountains of Israel. 
So when you begin to see that come to pass, whether it's five years, two years, five years, ten years, twenty years, remember my words. <laughs> and be encouraged. You've got something to pray about. You can say, Lord, thank you very much for this. And just remember that uh, Gog and Magog may not want to come down to Israel. But God is going to bring them down. Just remember that. He has a purpose. So, my friends, we have a tremendous work to do. <clears throat> I have no doubt about it. We are, have been called to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And our job now is to get right <clears throat> into step with the Messiah by the Spirit of God. Finally, let me say this. I always have to say it whenever I talk about intercession. People say, well, I, I've come to this time. I'm so glad to see this auditorium nearly full. Uh, I, I, I only hope that you came out of a burden concerning prayer. I don't know what else you'd want to spend a nice sunny morning like this from some of the cold climes you come from um, sitting in this auditorium surely you didn't come to be entertained I think you came because somewhere in your heart you know that the supreme priority is prayer Now, when you listen to the kind of thing I've said, people say, well, <clears throat> count me out. I'm too young. I'm too unspiritual. <clears throat> Mind you, God preserve us from those people who call themselves spiritual. <laughs> I've yet to find real intercessors amongst them. Really. I find spiritual people... Uh, intercessors are the most practical people down to earth very practical anyway that's just by the way people say count me out it's no good I always quote a Chinese proverb some people have rebuked me for so bringing in something that is not from the word of God <laughs> but it certainly sums up for me a little bit of very practical and relevant wisdom. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. If in your heart you know that God wants you to be an intercessor, if in your heart you recognize this matter of prayer for Israel as a priority, and yet you feel very unworthy, very unspiritual, very uh, insignificant, don't let that stop you taking the first step. Take the first step this morning with God. Tell him, Lord, I'm here. In my own need, I'm here. And I'm ready to be an intercessor. I want to tell you something. God is so short of candidates for this matter, he will grab you instantly. <laughs> The Holy Spirit will start your education within the next hours. I'm not joking. Within the next hours, you will begin to come into inexplicable situations and circumstances as all those who know what it is to be intercessors are led. And in it, God will teach you how to trust Him, how to overcome through worship, how to be thankful. 
how to have your mouth filled with praises. God will do it. Remember my Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Dear friends, this whole work amongst the Gentiles began with Jews. I have no doubt that they were intercessors when I think of that prayer meeting of the elders in Antioch and how they waited upon the Lord and ministered to the Lord to the Lord said separate me Saul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I've called them it was the beginning as it were in many ways of the great outreach it had earlier begun in Caesarea in a drawing room of a Roman officer a Gentile in a meeting filled with Gentiles upon which the Holy Spirit had begun. This is the most successful evangelistic mission ever launched by the church. It's gone all over the world. And you are the result of it. Dear friends, there were Jewish brothers and sisters who laid down their lives that the gospel might come to the Gentiles, risking all the misunderstanding and misinterpretation, all the anger and antagonism of the powers of darkness. They laid down their lives that you might come into the family of God and become partaker in the commonwealth of Israel. Is it too much to ask that in these last days there will be Gentile believers who will lay down their lives uh, that the Jewish people may be brought back into their own family? Dear friends, think about it. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? And I think... Derek, shall we ask if, if anyone wants to stand up? Just a moment of quietness but our heads bowed. If there are those of you who this day really know God is speaking to you about this matter of prayer and identification with this purpose of God concerning Israel and you would like to take that first step and it would help you to do it openly and we're not all going to watch you, we've got our heads bowed, perhaps you would like to just quietly stand up in the presence of God. Now, dear friends, don't do it easily. I'm not, jo I'm not joking when I said God is short of candidates. I should think there will be more joy in heaven over the number that have stood up here this morning than for a long time. And every one of you will be caught. Now, you've still got a chance to sit down. And I shall give you another half minute if you want to sit down, please sit down. Almighty God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the prophets, and the God of the apostles, and above all, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you now for this message here this morning, for the anointing of the Spirit, for the impact of the Word. We thank you for each one who has stood in response, submission and commitment to your purpose. And Lord, we bless them in your name. We do not ask your blessing because we know that your blessing comes upon them. We bless them now in your name. And we commend them to your grace, Lord, that you will lead them on from this first step 
you'll take them and bring them into the full outworking of your purpose in each one of these lives. Lord, may each one of these lives make an impact for the kingdom of God and the purposes of God, not only in Israel, but throughout the earth, Lord. We thank you for each one standing here, and we bless them in the name of Jesus. Please sit down. We'll pray for those who didn't stand. Many of you are intercessors already. I'd like to just pray for all those of you who are such, that God will renew you and keep you. Lord, we pray for everyone who is already an intercessor. Will you, dear Lord, keep each such one? Will you renew each such one? And will you grant that all of us may be educated and trained by the Holy Spirit and begin to learn something about prayer. We praise you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. May I just say one last word to those of you who stood. God has, will take you at your word. I'm particularly thrilled. Please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. I have the greatest regard for sisters, and particularly for some of these old sisters who, wherever I go all over the world, give themselves to prayer. But I'm particularly glad this morning to see such a number of young men who have stood in this matter of intercession. That's what we need. We need many more men who are able to lead in this whole thing. Now, may God preserve you from getting big ideas, but open yourself up to the work of the Holy Spirit that he may lead you in such a way that you may not only know the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit, but you may know what it is to lay down your life for him and for others. You cannot be an intercessor until in the end God brings you to that place and he's going to bring you there. I have no doubt that my little job has finished uh, in one sense. Derek and mine, we're going to have another session. We're going to go on in this matter. But in one sense, to bring you to this place is one big major point. Now the Holy Spirit needs to take you over and needs to start your education. And I can promise you, he will. And you'll never regret it. I have heard all over the world people who've told me how much they regret that they never committed themselves to the Lord. They've lost so much. They've wondered all. I have yet to meet a single person who has ever been to me and said, 20 years ago I committed myself to the Lord and I am so sorry that I did it. <laughs> I have never met a single one. I've only met people who've told me how they had a battle, how they committed themselves to the Lord and what he did with them over the years and how thankful they are that by his grace they were enabled to do it. May God bless you richly and abundantly and may he use you. Thank you. May your prayers be aligned with the Lord's prayers in all things. May you know the deep, deep love of the Messiah, Jesus.